Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Rapp, here to usher you in into the weekend. It is uh, the week before Homecoming Parade, and I want to remind folks at home that MCAT will be doing the Homecoming Parade on the 30th of September. It's going to be at 10 a.m. If you're not going to be here downtown Missoula, you can enjoy it on our Facebook page, MCAT TV Missoula, Missoula Media Media Resource. So, um, as of uh, the US, as the U.S. has gotten closer after the, uh, to India after the G20 summit, Canada straight up condemns the government under Modi. This comes at the heels of the death of Canadian activist British Columbia fighting for independence for the Sheikh. They, um, uh, they are a culture of folks who evolved from the Punjab region. They tend to wear headscarves, turbans known as Pungri. Their religious beliefs are very monotheism, which, like Christian and Muslim religions, one one God. So the deal is the 45 year old activist Hadim Singh was gunned down in British Columbia in June and since then the government officials and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau pointed their finger at the Indian government. Indian has conde condemned Canada's uh, condemning by kicking out the Can uh, Canadian ambassador and claiming Najir was a terrorist and Canada was harboring him. Uh, she kept been fighting for their independence, which has set back, which had a major setback in the 1980s when a revolution forced the Indian government to crack down and kill many of the Sheikh leaders. Uh, mind you, beforehand, the Muslims um, inside the region got their own country of Pakistan after World War II and at the, Brit, uh, at the end of the British rule in India. Critics accused Modi's Hindu nationalist government of seeking to suppress dissent using sedition laws and other legal weapons. Some critics of his administration, including intellectuals, activists, filmmakers, students, and journalists, have all been arrested, creating what Modi's opponents say is a culture of intimidation. Another thing that Canada has also had in the past uh, prevented the use of headscarves in their government positions, from police to government officials, from lawyers to politicians. A series of Quebec laws from June of 2019, which targeted non Sheikh, but Muslims and Jewish headwear tied to the religious beliefs. So far, tensions are high and the Canadian government still wishes to trade with India. Fortunately, the relationship is very strained by the Indian government because by on Thursday, they revoked visas from Canada. And in some cases, people were escorted out of the visa areas when they tried to apply. So the company that uh, processes visas um, in Canada announced services has been suspended and so far the Indian population in Canada is shocked and tourism from Canada alone accounts for 277,000 Canadians visiting the country in 2022 according to Indians Bureau of Immigration. Tensions are getting bad and so far Canada hasn't backed down pointing the finger at India for killing of the activists which they are currently investigating. Speaking of tensions, it's been one week since the United Auto Workers began their strike. The union president Sean Fain started in various manufacturers from GM to Forward in strategic locations to make maximum impact with very little being tapped uh, from the strike fund. Fain also mentioned that the U.S. government will have no say in negotiations as they refer to the rail worker strikes that saw President Biden back the owners through the 100-year law that allowed the government to interview and enforce a settlement. Sean Fain spoke against Trump and Biden in a speech this week condemning the fact that another billionaire millionaire who has never lived paycheck to paycheck doesn't know the plight of the auto worker. The Hill reported that Fain said, <clears throat> quote, there's a lot of things that need to be worked on, and we have been in the table every day, 24-7, for the last eight weeks. It's a shame, again, that the companies waited into the last week to start getting serious about talking about this. They wasted a lot of time. They told up front, don't do that. We told them up front. We expect to deal that these things early and often, and they chose not to do that, end quote. Wednesday saw the impacts of the manufacturers as owners of the big three battened down the hatches on sites, originally thought to be where the strikers would target, but uh, pulled the wool from under them and striking locations that make owners take a hit of around 100 to 125 million dollars in damages estimated with the uh, those numbers being consistent each week as the UAW seeks to expand and so far GM and uh, Celantis laid off 2400 workers recently as a result of the strike as of Wednesday uh, the next phase is to expand the strike today which no announcement so far this morning, as I'm talking right now, of course, you probably hear about it this afternoon. While the auto workers are in the very early stage of the strike, it's unclear the impacts that this will cause to the owner's bottom line, their pockets. Uh, let's talk a break. Let's take a break and let's go back to Montana. So the University of Montana is spending their time creating a vaccine for overdosing. 
With fentanyl becoming a big new drug scare of the 2020s, before it was opioids, before that was meth, vaccines goal is to block receptors of the drug known as fentanyl, which has caused the majority of overdoses the last couple of years. 2021 saw uh, 70,000 overdoses related deaths uh, related to fentanyl. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, opioid involved overdose deaths rose from 21,000 in 2010 to 47,000 in 2017 and remained steady through 2019. This was followed by a significant increase in 2020 with 68,000 reported deaths and again in 2021 with 80,000 reported overdose deaths. The vaccine proje project at University of Montana came out of a $33 million NIH contract a few years ago with the Missoula flagship. The NIH also served as the catalyst for the partnership between Evans and Marco uh, Prevotoni, uh, now with the University of Montana and previously with the University of Mon Minnesota. The vaccine includes uh, an ingredient from their team that elicits the production of antibodies against the target opioid, and it includes an ingredient from the UM research team called adjuvalent, which boosts the effectiveness of the vaccine. Can you imagine a vaccine that blocks the drug effects, thus voiding the need to take them in the first place? The UM uh, offers one of the largest university-based academic research teams for vaccine discovery and development in the country, and was a major reason UM landed on the list of best universities solving their coronavirus pandemic of 2020. Human trials will require folks to take fentanyl in a safe environment to see results in terms of human innovation. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, speaking of human in innovation, looks like Ohio wants to make basically air taxis uh, reality by 2025. The, with plenty of propulsion, this EV Toll aircraft is being touted as the next big thing in ride sharing innovation. Noise pollution will be uh, mild compared to the general sounds of urban cities and has up to six propellers able to transport vertically and travel up to 200 miles per hour. Imagine giant drones in the air landing in various locations delivering people. Uh, Dayton International Airport delivers on due decades of groundwork laid by the state's leaders. Republican Lieutenant Governor John Hust said, importantly, the site is near Wright Patterson Air Force Base and the headquarters of the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratories. You heard it right. It's the Wright brothers, the fathers of the planes, where the first flight over the over in Ohio hundreds of years ago took place. The 500 million dollar project is supported up to 325 million dollars in incentives from the state of Ohio. Plans to uh, build an Ohio a facility capable of delivering up to 500 aircrafts a year and creating 3,000 new jobs. The U.S. Department of Energy has invited Jobby to apply for a loan to support a development for the facility as a clean energy project. Good luck! Who knows where this will change the game? Most likely who, those who can afford them, plus online influencers will um, will get a chance to look make the rest of us jokers look jealous as they implement these crafts over the next decade so um, <clears throat> speaking of future influencers here's a series of short videos made by the kids of our Saturday drop-ins and when I come back we're going to talk about some movies you have to wake up listen to me MCAT's kid centric activity is back with Saturday drop-ins starting September 2nd this weekly creative experience lets kids use stop animation to breathe life into their Legos and more they're only limited by their imagination, and here at MCAT we promote creativity for kids aged 8 to 14. Ah! Join us inside Missoula Public Library every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. <laughs> hey y'all, come look at this!
Hey guys, we are back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. It's time for Pre-Critic, where I prejudge a movie based on absolutely nothing but my pre-judginess prejudices towards movies in general, so we're going to kick things off with Expendables 4s or Expend 4 Bowls uh, as back as uh, is back after some time away getting injected with all sorts of testosterone and other late 50s and early 60s drugs uh, that keeps these old guys from falling apart long enough to get those money shots. Uh, get Megan like a fox in this movie and you have a character uh, bring in the, the, my demographic of those who tolerated her in Transformers for an action-packed one last ride. That's not quite the one last ride as they Expendables are not quite living up to their namesake, uh, since most of them have been shown in every single movie, and the only person they've actually technically killed off is Liam Hemsworth in the Expendables 2 movie, but I haven't really been, been paying attention too much to that uh, thing as well. So moving on, uh, we, <laughs> we also have It Lives Inside. Welcome to a horror film that has people who worked on such gems like Get Out! End of list. Enjoy a series of spooky, scary commentary on society from a story of an Indian American teen as she gets haunted by her loneliness demon who feeds on her negative, lonely heart and torments her. Nothing like boredom and nothing to be created in this kind of uh, movie genre. Uh, finally, we have a movie called Relax, I'm From the Future. It's kind of those zany sci-fi indie films with the New Zealand character actor from the Flight of the Concords and Our Flags Mean Death, uh, Rise Darby, a future guy comes back in time to get stuck and has to readjust to our time and have some basic fish out of water stories. So remember that uh, Rick Moranis and Hulk Hogan film, Suburban Commando? No reason, just vibes. It basically is that, but there are consequences to him being there and bad people want to get rid of him while people from the present join him to save his and their future along the way. And those, basically, that's, you know, what you see is kind of what you get with those kind of movies, for sure. And up next, we have a not black and white dub and stuff movie from the 1966 uh, film, Blow Up. Yeah, I know it seems repetitive, but, you know, going through the door, you know, it's, I I'm just trying to make a constant for all these videos. Uh, so, you uh, like my studio? I've never met a man who lives where he works. How bohemian. Uh, so I was thinking that maybe we can get some, uh, I, I can cook you some food. I got, uh, macaroni. I got, um, <clears throat> all sorts of things. I got cheese slices in the fridge if you want some. Oh, um, fine. I'll keep it light. Uh, maybe I'll get you something to drink. Uh, do you like uh, Italian soda? electricity. Hmm. Well, that support beam you're looking at used to be, belong to Blackbeard the Pirate. Excuse me, could you make my whiskey wet? Huh? I like it wet. I don't like it dry. Okay, I'll add some water to it, I guess. You know, if you want it a little bit wetter, then, you know, that'll diffuse it. Oh, excuse me, Blackbeard. Here you go. One wet whiskey for you. You know, I don't always dress like I'm in a country mm, Maybe club. I should get going. Uh, what do you mean? I'm getting tired. Talking like this makes me very tired. At least stay for another drink or something like that. Might as well finish. Weren't you going to get some food? Mm, whatever you want. Food is good. You look hungry. Hmm. Um, I don't know what I quite want to eat right now. Perhaps, uh, mm, maybe you choose. Ugh. Mm. Perhaps some um, Chinese checkout? Takeout? No, that doesn't sound good. Well, uh, maybe Mexican food? I was thinking Taco Baco. Oh, that's a stupid idea. Mm. Well, how about we go to, like, a, you know, barbecue place, you know, like a club or whatever? Um, hmm, I don't know. Maybe. Oh, well, great. I'll order a couple hamburgers, some fries, and, well, you don't really hmm. look very pleased about that option. Hmm. No, it's, it's fine. I, I don't care. Whatever you want. Okay, come over here for a second. You see this thing? It's, it's just paper. Yes, it is a, a purple piece of paper. Say that five times fast. Well, I do hate to put people on the spot, but you are modeling for me, so I would like for you to, you know, be a little bit more cooperative. It's not always about you, you know. Ugh, fine. Who needs to eat? I'm on the European diet of eat whatever I find on the street, so who cares? You know, I'll find some food. Grab a seat. We'll just hang out. We don't have to eat. We'll just finish our drinks and then just uh, kind of do our own thing. Hmm... Well, I would like to have something to eat before we continue. I'll eat just about anything. Perhaps some pizza? Uh, is she actually making a suggestion? Oh, um... Oh, yes. Pizza sounds just right. 
We can order it. They can deliver it to us. Uh, uh, gotta get that phone before she changes her mind. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Operator. Operator. Uh, uh, hey, operator. Ow. Ah, jeez. Operator. Operator. I need, a, I need the closest pizza place. Hello. Hello. I need pizza right now. Okay, so what kind of pizza would you like to have? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can choose. Oh, no. You better talk to them. I don't care. Well, go ahead. Order. Oh, no, you order. I'm order shy. Just make sure it's not spicy and has plenty of jalapenos. All right. Hey, do you guys have Canadian bacon and pineapple? <laughs> Hey guys, we are back. Let's talk about some city council stuff. It's time for city council. I don't know why I said it that way, but let's let's kick things off. Um, this is uh, uh, the first comment. You know, we have a couple. Uh, we have some public comment, and this is Dr. Eric Green, a wildlife biologist, talks about Fort Missoula ecology. Talks about the migratory birds that use the island adjacent from uh, the uh, Fort Missoula through the Bitterroot River. And so this is uh, what he had to say about the importance of preserving this uh, natural landscape more than 32 species of waterfowl. Scientific research on the effects of um, development near riparian areas recommends that setbacks should be about three to 400 feet. Setbacks of at least 100 to 150 feet are recommended for many migrant birds. The Missoula County Riparian Resource Protection Zoning Regulations <gasps> Uh, stipulate a 400-foot set along the Bitterroot River. Um, on the habitat map, I've, I've shown with the star the location of the proposed townhouse developments at Post Hospital at Fort Missoula, and those buildings would be within about 30 feet or so of the riparian habitat at Slavens Island. The riparian habitat at Fort Missoula is a natural gem. All the pieces for a world-class natural area are there right now we just have to make sure we don't mess it up all right there are many so that was um that was dr eric green talking a little bit more about this and so far 50 percent of all montana species spotted in the area annually make it a prime location for bird watchers to get a diverse look at montana birds and so that's uh, one of the more important ones that's one of the presentations and for those of you who don't really kind of know what's going on with the Missoula area. The old hospital, they're trying to convert it to add some more condos and living arrangements there, but the whole entirety of Fort Missoula is technically just uh, not even um, residential land at all. And so this uh, weird transition, um, is, it's, it's, it's interesting for sure. There's a bigger story behind this, but this is just another example of how to uh, keep this area preserved for future generations uh, who can enjoy the historic museum at Fort Missoula. Uh, uh, public hearing. Uh, so far, uh, one of the big things they were talking about is CDBG um, home um, grants, and these are federal grants that are geared towards helping federal funds leverage local development and creating housing infrastructure improvements through the funding that has existed for decades. For example, BBB is technically, uh, you know, the Build Back Better grant is technically raised grant. So, you know, when you apply for it, you would apply for raised grants. Well, the uh, one grant that's part of federal government is called the Block Grant, which the uh, city of Missoula, Missoula has been utilizing, getting $13 million uh, grants for the uh, Mullen Build Project of the new Mullen area as well. Um, this presentation is about the outcomes of the federal money, and here is Kendra Lysom with some of the uh, review of some of these programs, and this is what she had to say. Program year 2022 was the fourth year of our 2019 through 2023 consolidated plan which means this current program year will be the last year of our current con plan. With that in mind, um, we're currently in the process of updating our plan for the next five years. The data and information we collect now will help inform how we spend our CDBG and home dollars in the future. And as a part of that, we're kicking off a survey of housing and community development challenges facing Missoula residents. Um, the survey is open to all Missoula residents and we wanna know things like is your house's housing situation currently meeting your needs? What is your experience finding housing in Missoula? How could it be improved? Have you felt you were denied housing because of how you look or because you have kids or a disability? 
You can share your experience by using the QR code. You hold your um, smartphone camera up to the screen and it should take you right to the survey. Or you can go to the URL that's on your screen as well. Um, your answers will help shape housing solutions for the city of Missoula over the next five years. And you'll be entered to win a $100 Visa gift card. Okay. And so hopefully that'll help uh, grease the wheels to move forward to get more uh, information from folks on this uh, topic as well. So these grants were used to leverage development for using federal dollars and were uh, to the go-to tool for the city when creating affordable housing. Uh, just shy of $1 million between the two grant sources, the presentation talks about the impact. Um, and this is what they had to say. We receive around the same amount every year, which means that the funds aren't adjusted for inflation. So we're really having to do more with less. With the allocation plus any program income we received from past projects, we were able to fund a total of four projects. We have come a long way this year with the leasing up of the Villagio and Trinity in particular. And you can see that our CDBG and home dollars do make a difference in our community. Okay. Let's see here. Affordable Housing Trust Fund is something that the city of Missoula created in conjunction with the pandemic and are able to get add more funds based on money raised by the uh, Missoula Redevelopment Agency using TIFFs. However, uh, pop-ups. Hold on a second. Oh, stop it. Stop popping up my note. You're in the way of my notes. <laughs> okay, I can't. Okay. Sorry, some technical problems here for some reason. I get uh, like some pop up for some kind of site thing. I've been trying to whatever. So however, even so far as federal dollars go, not much goes towards homelessness as it goes to bolstering development affordability on the horizon instead of at the forefront for a lot of these issues. Lower Miller Creek is still dealing with a roundabout in terms of who's paying for it and for its development. The argument is that the developer wants to uh, the adjacent neighborhood to help pay for the development while residents think that the new neighborhood being developed should incur the costs since the new neighborhood is going to add the most impact on the traffic of the area. Sandra Vasica, uh, council, uh, city council, talks about the process as, and her reaction to this as well. So let's find her. And speaking uh, at the meeting last Wednesday, it, it seemed like we totally uh, pulled a bait and switch, and that's not how a good government process. Um, what the developer originally wanted was to um, for the city to adhere to the original developer agreement that was signed months ago, and then for us to just have this completely um, random number out of nowhere that nobody is really sure about what this num where this number came from. Um, I, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's fair. So uh, I would highly recommend my colleagues uh, do do not vote uh, for this amendment to be added in. And so for the amendment, it was basically to put a cap on how much money the the developer would spend, which would be the one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. Stacey Anders responds to the uh, no votes for this particular amendment. The intent of that amendment was for the developer, and it got squishy at the end because it was eleven o'clock at night when we were doing these. But the intent was to have the developer pay for one hundred percent of the roundabout. Now. I understand upon further legal review, we've been advised by the city attorney that that would not probably stand up in court. And we are now here with a development agreement to um, proportionally pay for portions of the roundabout. Um, and it does seem a bit unfair that at a date to be determined in the future, we will figure out how to assess the further properties that fall into this area as well as the existing homes that live in the area on who's responsible for paying for what parts of it and that if these two parcels in one phase 1a get their building permits in before we have that further discussion, they would be exempt from it. And this is where I'm going with my question for the city attorney who I know is listening, is the if the decision we make for putting some of the costs go to an SID that is boundary specific, these two parcels would be within that boundary and therefore would be assessed just like any current home, correct? There are a series of um, 
properties in that area, in, in some within River Run Trails and some nearby River Run Trails that are yet to be developed that would be drawn and included within the boundary of NSID, and it wouldn't matter if it was included uh, in this development agreement or not. Those would be assessed, you know, over the period of time uh, that the SID is established for. Okay, so that was uh, City Attorney Ryan Sergebury answering that question. Um, uh, let's see, the main goal was to alleviate the costs of the current landowners in this area to include votes impacting this area. So the flat rate for developers was left out of the amendment because it didn't address the potential impact of the new neighborhood development as it correlates with the roundabout. Uh, the city county pushed, uh, puts it in roundabouts left and right and it has been proven safe with data, but the cost with where these things get complicated, as in the past, many roundabouts were funded through the state and federal as a means for funding. So Mike Nugent reflects on the process and our relationship with the private sector um, and talks a little bit more about this. The, the sum may be reasonable, but it's poorly thought out. And if we're going to be considered a good partner for people to work with, consistency is reasonable. And the amendment was so last second that it wasn't even noticed on Monday at council. It was added to the agenda with less than 24 hours. And, you know, to the comment about something that happened three years ago, five of the people at this horseshoe weren't even on council um, three years ago, including myself. Uh, so I don't think that because somebody did something past, we should hold that to a different standard. I think that if we want to do things like that for the weeks that that agreement was sitting there and had been agreed to by the developer and submitted back to the city and we didn't add anything that was ample time even a week before it could have been a different conversation but i just i think that if we want to be have any credibility at all as a local government there are some basic expectations and, and we cannot treat people like oh they can just handle everything just because they're the bad guy in some situation or they can handle it like that's not that is in no way good decorum that is in no way a reasonable approach to work with a private sector, whether you like them or not. Um, you know, I think that there's a reasonable expectation of fairness and, um, you know, it should be applied to everybody. Okay. And so let's see. Towards the end of the meeting, the city voted to re re repeal a levy that would have provided the voters a chance to, uh, wait, sorry. Um, yeah, so the process, you know, the amendment didn't pass, um, but the public hearing on the further matter of the development of the roundabout did move forward in conjunction with the development. And so this will be under final consideration next, uh, next, uh, next, next Monday. All right, so that's pretty much it for city council. Now we're going on to community meetings. And so the, one of the bigger takeaways for me was the uh, uh, Grant Creek, 35 miles per hour sign being voted in during public works. Um, climate conservation and parks are going to the uh, after school business as the flagship program lost their funding source through the Western Montana over the summer. This $139,000 will go to staff to help bolster programs that started at Lowell School and Officer Summit Franklin and this uh, as Franklin uh, Elementary and also CS Porter. This grant allocation is part of a network of funding. Parks and Recreation is working with the MCPS to secure in order to continue to reach goals surrounding serving every child and family in this matter. Uh, just some history, you know, some after school programs, you know, in the 90s, you know, one of the big pushes to uh, have these kind of federally uh, sponsored camps and after school programs was to basically mitigate drug use. And it was like the war on drugs is like, oh, we got to keep these kids active. We got to keep these kids busy, get them off them drugs. And so that was mostly what the 90s were about. Early 2000s, the federal government paid for many programs that I was also a part of over the summer with very little supervision, mind you, but all fun all the same. Uh, then flagship depended on a lot of state funding and federal dollars. You know, I did work with flagship for many, many years and a lot of kids didn't want to uh, send thank you letters to their politicians at the time for political reasons, but I'm getting off topic since MPCPS and Parks and Rec worked with the library and their partners like MCAT to have programs last uh, spring. And so with this expansion, they hope to kind of utilize this as well. So um, Shirley Kinsey uh, talks a little bit more about these topics and um, this program in general. The anticipation of receiving this grant of uh one a hundred and thirty nine thousand one twenty five uh, we did ask for spending authority in our fy 24 budget so 
this uh, just a little background, this partnership with MCPS is in its fourth year at Lowell, um, where we initiated the community school model. And it's proven very supportive to the families, um, providing them with wraparound services for not only health equity, but child care and uh, engagement um, into the community activities. So we've, we, we've always had the goal of replicating this program and everyone has been so supportive, uh, especially MCPS and a lot of other donors. Um, so we were able to replicate this program to a degree all right, and so you know they were able to fill in a gap, but it wasn't the uh, 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 a lot of the gap since not so long ago MCAT offered after-school programs through this flagship, and that saw various programs with anywhere between 50 and 100 kids for the eight of the MCPS schools. However, this is a very new program that can fill in a gap. Uh, just not all the holes left behind. The city moved to support this expansion to help uh, alleviate parents who need the after-school programs to facilitate their busy schedules. As we get deeper into the meeting, the Marshall Mountain Plan was presented during the meeting in hopes of answering the bigger questions on the acquisition of the former ski lodge and the redevelopment of the area, to which they plan to tear down the lifts and restoring it to the, to the, the trails and natural landscape in accordance with the open space bond and the private funds raised through various interest parties to utilize public recreational space. Um, most open space acquisition isn't like a park, but public land for folks to enjoy like any other lands managed by federal agencies. But a little bit more, less restrictive access and you don't need to get some kind of like a um, parking pass or something like that to park in federal lands as well. So Morgan Valiant the ma uh, with the master plan and open space parks manager talks about the uh, motivation behind the purchase, a little bit more of the uh, site history. And 2021, um, a lot of things happened. And quite honestly, between uh, the generosity of the landowner that owned the base area and then five valleys land trust um the area started to see a lot more events and programming um large community events big races uh day camps you name it there's a lot of programming that was occurring on site um, from a city's perspective uh the majority of our outdoor recreation programming our after school programs our um, uh, summer camps really rely on the site they actually we built our programs around using marshall um, it, it's hard to get federal service uh u.s forest service permits anymore and so marshall really was the home that we could build our own parks and recreation outdoor rec program all right so that expansion really kind of helped bolster some of those programs as well and you know this is through the montana uh, missoula parks and recreation um after years of presentations and more city clearly wants to buy the property, the save the date is October 4th, and I'm gonna repeat it again. So October 4th at Missoula Public Library at three o'clock in the Cooper Room. So it's on the fourth floor, October 4th at the Missoula Public Library. They're gonna have a joint city county meeting because both county and city are going to purchase this. So Morgan talks about the public input for this particular purchase by uh, asking people if they should spend the open space bond money on this. Every time we went out to the public, we had public engagement records. We had over 20,000 visits to engage Missoula. Uh, our, our, our second highest visits was the, um, what was it, the West Broadway, uh, or no, uh, Northside Parks and Trails plan, which had about 5,000 visits. So Marshall's gotten a lot of traffic online. We had 724 people attend that community celebration when we uh, kicked off our community visioning process. We had over 2,600 people respond to public surveys that we had out in our three different public comment periods. We had over 93 individual participants rec uh, representing dozens of different stakeholder groups that facilitated focus group and stakeholder meetings. And then as uh, we also had just dozens of meetings with the adjacent neighbors, the adjacent land managers, other public boards and committees um, throughout uh, the entire project time. All right, so suffice to say, there were a lot of people who uh, wanted this thing to happen. Um, a joint city council, uh, city county survey 
went out to folks and 71% wanted to the purchase to go, 15% people were, 15 were against, and 14% were just kind of unsure. Uh, Zach Covington's staff, uh, who worked on the master plan, explains their goals and expenditures and uh, talks a little bit more about that. Hold on a second, let me just, okay. The project falls within one of the 2019 open space uh, cornerstones found in the open space plan. Uh, it is adjacent uh, and on the border of two different planning regions for the for the county, uh, the Missoula uh, planning region and the Potomac Valley. So there, that partnership was was uh, critical in in this project. I'm just going to skim over these really quick because you've seen them before, but I just wanted to remind remind you that staff and OSAC and OLC did a lot of homework and, and went through their processes, the vetting processes, to make sure that this project aligns with open space values uh, in the bond itself, in the Missoula Urban Area Open Space Plan, in city ordinances, both with the types and values related to open space, um, and also state code. And lastly, uh, the most recent um, City of Missoula Strategic Goals we wanted to make sure we, we really analyzed how the project aligns and fits within all of those all of those goals. All right. And so uh, as we get further into this uh, meeting, um, originally this was a uh, $1.8 million acquisition, but the biggest thing in the public safety and access to the site, which includes ski lifts, are no longer functional. On top of that, removal of older buildings and lodges, while they still want to keep the iconic clock tower, many things are left behind the old ski lodge has uh, has to be dealt with and so when they purchase this the redevelopment and the overall costs are going to be 3.8 million dollars most of which will be covered by the open space bond nathan mcleod talks about bringing up it up to code and making it safe for trails and hiking so here's a uh, more of the presentation the slopes are very steep the existing trail system that um, is on the izzy dog property is quite steep and you have to be pretty darn fit to be able to get up to the upper mountain. And so in the plan, we have a, a loop trail, so an up and a down that would be built to adaptive mountain bike standards. So that's for folks with mobility impairments that have to use a hand cycle to, to pedal up. Um, the trail would be built to those types of standards for better accessibility. It would also be easier access for all folks, be it on bikes or hiking or walking as well. Um, other improvements would be there's a base area loop trail that's proposed and that loop trail will be graded at the, the lowest grade that we can on the site because the base area is really the only flat part of the mountain. We'll actually be able to get a trail that's going to be designed primarily for use by, by youth. So kids that are learning to bike or hike or have um, opportunities for environmental education, but it could also serve as a, as a trail for winter recreation such as Nordic skiing or snowshoeing. All right. So those are some of the opportunities they wish to implement there. Um, the main point of the master plan was to look at the potential of the site and build off the paths, creating um, more open space, parkland and trails uh, with the goal of year round access. Those were the main goal, uh, main three guys working on this project on behalf of the city county. Uh, city council had some questions and comments on this acquisition. Martha Becerra talks about funding and questions. Uh, Nathan McLeod talks about uh, both county and city funding with land that's not inside the city limits, hence the jurisdiction a little bit further on this. So this is what they had to say. It was decided uh, between the county and the city that any projects that were located on some of those bordering planning regions for open space could be joint projects. And so I think in this particular case where the city is really the one, you know, really largely running the programs right now, you know, the kids programs, outdoor programs, it's a huge asset for for the for that particular reason for for the city residents, um, but it's also within the unincorporated county area, right? And so we, I think at that time they felt it was a really good idea to make that a partnership and to bring funding in from both from both uh, city and county. I think early on in the process as well, the city was initially looking at potentially being the owner, and a lot of that uh, morphed and changed through conversations with the county, uh, and, and so. From our perspective, from an open space planning and acquisition perspective, it makes a lot of sense to utilize funding from both the city and the county uh, open space bond uh, funds. I don't know if there's any other. Yeah, I, I guess one thing to add, and um, you know, it's um, it's actually 
kind of common for the city to acquire city land that is outside the city limits. Uh, for instance, we've got 500 acres at the top of Dean Stone that is still in the county. Uh, the 200 acres in Marshall Canyon. Okay. I'll just stop there. There's just a lot of examples that he brought up as well, but the whole point of a lot of the, what they're saying is that technically the county would own the land while the city would manage it. Um, the point of this as well is that if you actually look into the uh, the way that the bond, the open space bond was created from uh, 2006 and then reinvented in 2018 is that both the city and the county generate uh, a, a cumulative total of $15 million to the open space bond and you know, half, 7.5 goes to the city, 7.5 goes to the county. And um, if I'm just kind of speaking off the cuff, uh, city of Missoula is very urbanized, kind of like there's not there's not too many opportunities for open space in this within the city limits compared to the county, which takes over quite a bit of space from here all the way to Sealy Lake. So imagine some of the uh, opportunities that the uh, county can get with open space bond money to uh, basically create our own uh, uh, What's that called? Uh, I, I'm trying to think of a fancy word for uh, Missoula County Park land acquisition. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'll think of it at some point. But Morgan Valiant uh, chimed in at the end to explain the funding park of this is essentially the county will own the property. Uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park is the last large example of the partnership where the land is county and the city manages it through Parks and Rec. Uh, Morgan um, Valiant uh, comes back, uh, he's the open space lands manager, uh, comes back to elaborate how good a deal the city county has with this particular purchase. And this is the last quote for my city council report. What we heard loud and clear is that this project is really about access and trails and connections and providing an envelope to expand programming and especially connecting youth. And I, I, I think we will hit most of those marks with um, that initial round of, uh, let's call it phase one development. Um, there are a, a lot more that could be added and a lot, a lot of ways to expand all those great opportunities and benefits. And one thing that I've really been um, happy about with this project is we have had so many good partners coming out of the woodwork and so many people that want to see this happen that I do think uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful we can carry that partnership through to help with development. And then also I think that the interlocal that we're developing with the county is really going to be um, beneficial for the community because we're going to have two entities jointly working on bringing resources to to bear and so um, all right so that was the uh the uh, Morgan Valley and talking about the hopes and the future of this particular site. And like I said before, if you want to have your uh, input on this particular item, city county will have a joint meeting on October 4th, which is Wednesday at the library. It's going to be on the fourth floor from 3 to 5 p.m. They'll discuss this with the public in a final push to acquire this land by winter 2023-2024. For more information, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. Up next, we have Mark Gibbons. Um, the uh, Montana Poet Laureate uh, reading a poem for you guys. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about some um, events that are happening in the city of Missoula. This one is a, a poem I wrote after my dad died, which is kind of why I decided to, you know, sort of try and take myself seriously as a poet and at the same time say that you should never take yourself seriously as a poet, for Christ's sake. But... Uh, uh, he died, and I think that gave me an excuse to, uh, to, to tell family secrets or something, maybe. So, I mean, because I, all of a sudden, I just opened up and, and went for it. That and the fact that he drank too much. Uh, he was an alcoholic, and, uh, and you know, the, the effects of that in a family situation, you, as a kid, you, you know what that's all about. And I didn't want to do that to my kids in a way that I thought, yeah, you probably ought to think about something other than being the, you know, I was a truck driver, kind of a <laughs> drugged out, smoking, <laughs> drinking, stupid, having fun guy. <laughs> so, Family Plots is the title of this poem. Avoiding the work of weeding is a habit handed down from my dad, a piss-poor farmer who'd only raised hell and a few eyebrows. 
Panicky days I wish I could be the good gardeners my brothers are. Plant some burgundy lupin or painted pansies neatly in short clipped grass. But I must find my own headstone, discover my faith in earth rich in blood as the sandy hole we dug on Petty Creek for the fired remains of our father. Funny, my old man liked reading cemetery markers, but wanted to be buried in a gunny sack. We did it wrong, left him bound in a strong plastic bag, sealed inside a cardboard box. Dropped him square in the ground, staged a silly B-movie conclusion. Only mother's tears played right. Weeks later, my brother and I dug up dad. Our final family plot as outlaw sons, afternoon grave robbers digging for gold dust and whispering our need to be good boys again. We cut the smothering shroud, freed his flinty ash at last, our skin and bones to breathe deeply the burlap, the soil and stone. We put him back in the dirt, sent him home. So, cute little book. All right, we are back. We're here to talk about some events that are happening within the city of Missoula. Um, that is one of the many uh, things that we do here at MCAT is film a lot of events that happen within the city of Missoula. A lot of it is having to do in conjunction with the uh, Missoula Big Read. So the Missoula Big Read is happening all weekend long. You guys can check it out at the Missoula Public Library's website for listings and more, missoulapubliclibrary.org. Uh, so Climate Conversa uh, Conservation Workshop is happening this morning at 9.30 a.m. We have the most solutions to, uh, we need to address the climate crisis, but do we know how to get them supported by implemented? 94% of Americans rarely or never talk about climate change, creating a chasm of s shared support. According to Catherine Hiho, uh, climate scientist and um, expert climate communicator, uh, creating connections through shared values is one of the most important actions that we can do to make a, a everyday difference. Join Families for a Livable Climate for a workshop and practice session and learn how to have more effective climate conversations with your family, friends, and colleagues. And this is going to be at the Missoula Public Library this morning. Um, Tiny Tales and Storytime, as always, at 1030 here at the Public Library on the second floor. It's weekly. goes on every week. Um, family fun times. Uh, if you want some indoor fun, it's kind of rainy outside this weekend. It's been kind of weird weather. Uh, we had a little bit of smoke this week as well. Um, family fun time. Um, uh, this you know, all the indoor fun, Mismo Gymnastics, Rich Extra Sports Center, YMCA. These are plenty of great, uh, Valentine Center is uh, one of the many locations that you can have um, some indoor recreation with plenty of space to let your kids run around. Heart Saver uh, Combination First Aid with CPR Lifelong Learning Center is doing a series of uh, life-saving classes where you can get certified in CPR and first aid. Um, this is starting at 10 a.m. Lifelong Learning Center is like the uh, night school for people who want to continue education. You pay per class and you don't have to go through the whole system of going through a whole education and you can get certified on these kind of classes and more. A Missoula fairy tale, uh, Green Bench Orchard. A uh, Missoula fairy tale is a village of wee whimsical houses made by local artists displayed at the Green Bench Orchard in Missoula. Uh, vi uh, village viewing dates are from uh, 5 to 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday, September 18th through the 21st, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, then Friday through Sunday, uh, September 22nd to the 24th. Uh, Green Bench Orchard is a U-Pick service organic grower of 185 apple trees with eight varier varieties. Visiting the fairy village is free. However, the fairies and the makers who create their homes appreciate your donations. Stop behavior before it starts. Missoula Salvation Army. Uh, so this is part of their uh, most effective ways to manage challenging behavior. Learn how to identify the function of the behavior. Make changes to avoid disruptive behavior and implement replacement behavior, this training will especially take into account working with uh, neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse youth, but the strategies are useful for all youth. So if you have a problem child and need a little bit more support uh, from folks, the Salvation Army is hosting something at 10 a.m. as well. And like I said, uh, the, uh, the big read event is happening all month long in September. Join through the special story time at 10.30 this morning 
related to the big read. The Cold Millions by Jess Walters Storytime is for children age three and older and their caregivers. Friday Storytime is, is recorded and posted online at a later date on the library's official website and YouTube channel. Lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. This is a recurring event. This is the best place for folks to get some uh, meals and lunch and uh, uh, challenge other people to bridge and uh, all sorts of uh, backgammon type games. I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. But moving on, uh, Yarns at Missoula Public Library. It's a, a weekly event happening every uh, Friday at, at noon on the fourth floor in the back Blackfoot room. Lego Club at 2.30 p.m. Uh, in the afternoon on the second floor. All the kids' events are always on the ki second floor. Big Night, Spectrum Discovery Center. This is their 10th annual Big Night fundraiser to support Science for All, ensuring that all children in Montana have access to hands-on science and inspirational role models. Your support is crucial to Spectrum efforts in providing providing barrier-free access to hands-on science education. Uh, Big Night raises funds to support uh, Spectrum. Wine, Women, and Shoes. Um, the Ronald McDonald House Charities of West Montana is hosting their first annual Wine, Women, and Shoes event at the Hilton Garden Inn in Missoula on Friday, September 22nd. Uh, the, an irresistible blend of fashion and compassion. The WWNS event is all about putting the fun into fundraising. So this is at the Hilton Garden tonight at 6 p.m. Modern Natives, uh, rock music at Imagination Brewing Company starting at 6 p.m. Socialize with Socialists, Qantas Park, or they're gonna be at Union Club, get in a pint starting at 6 p.m. An evening with Goose is gonna be a jam band at Kittle House Amphitheater. Ec uh, ecstatic Dance uh, at Sacred Alley. Um, live music with uh, uh, Blooming Jasmine. This is going to be some uh, Cranky Sam Public House Jasmine starting at 7 p.m. Battle of the Badges, Fort Missoula Regional Park is hosting a police versus firefighter softball game. You guys can check that out. It's going to be um, 7 p.m. tonight. It's their fourth annual tailgate tournament. There'll be booths with, with helpful safety information activities for kids and swag for the whole family. Montana Naturalist Six Day Course and Certification, Swan Valley Connections. The Montana Nat uh, Master Naturalist Program is designed for adults who want to stroke, st uh, stoke their curiosity, deepen their knowledge of their natural world, and give back to their communities in new ways. They hope the participants will not only build the uh, skills to interpret Montana, flora, fauna, and landscapes, but they will also gain deeper understanding and appreciation for the natural world and therefore become better stewards of this program that is an excellent certification for those looking to pursue a career in environmental education and interpretive guiding, or those just looking to enhance their connection to place. <coughs> and this is going to be off Highway uh, 83 in Condon, Montana. And so, yeah, this is like a, a six-day course in certification. It's kind of like a whole outing and everything. So uh, it might be a little bit last minute for people who want to just jump on right now. So if you're interested in going out and about tonight, uh, Monks is doing some DJ music featuring Equinox Sticks and Stones Fish Bowl. Uh, Kyle Curtis and The Promised Land is going to be at Union Club at 9 p.m. And those are pretty much it for your Friday events. As we kick off for your Saturday, the 62nd annual Kiwanis Pancake Breakfast or Grin Park at Allegiance Field, the baseball field in downtown Missoula. Don't miss the Qantas Club of Missoula's 60 second annual pancake breakfast. The, uh, the breakfast runs from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. and features all-you-can-eat pancakes, sausage, coffee, and orange juice. New this year is the Guns and Horses softball game between Missoula Police and Fire Department at 10 a.m. Admission is $5 and kids aged 5 and under are free. Get that car blowed and head over to the Missoula markets from 1 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, so all those markets are ongoing and will end at towards the end of October. So <coughs> it'll be the time to get your fresh produce and all sorts of uh, fun things that you can get there before the winter market starts happening at the, uh, I believe it's going to be at the, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, the Southgate Mall and also Orchard Homes does their own winter uh, uh, attachment for uh you know, farmer's market type stuff. So uh, if you're interested in going up to uh, Lolo area, Dunrovin is doing trail rides. It's a horseback trail ride along the scenic Bitterroot River through the beautiful Lolo National Forest. It's open on this special Saturday. All proceeds from the trail rides will be generously donated to River Pines Horse Sanctuary. For more information, go to DunrovinRanchMontana.com, DunrovinRanchMontana.com. Fifth, annual Climate and Clean Expo. Karis Park is doing a uh, clean expo in conjunction with, um, let's see, Climate Smart Missoula. Missoula's annual Climate and Clean Energy Expo is back for the fifth year, save the date, and plan to join us Karis Park to get plugged into all the things climate solutions, clean energy, and sustainability. 20 local businesses and non-profit solar installers, an electric car and bike show, information present presentation, kit activities, and more. This is free. It's at Karis Park. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the Missoula Art Museum, they do muse me me ah, 
They do museum tours every Saturday at 11 a.m. Um, it just basically get a chance to look at all of these art galleries and have a guided tour. Um, also, at 1 p.m. on Saturday every week, MCAT does our Saturday drop-ins for kids interested in making their own short videos using stop animation. Um, also, if the kids want to do some outdoor fall foliage, uh, Nat, uh, the uh, Montana Natural History Center is hosting their own kids activity at 1 p.m. as well. Apple cider, cidering at, in the Rattlesnake. The Rattlesnake Market is hosting a cid cidering of apples for uh, uh, your... Uh, oh, so, join us for... Uh, Join us to savor fresh apple cider. Try your hand at pressing apples. Visit the neighbors. Learn new things about Montana bears and find out what's happening in the Rattlesnake watershed. Uh, Bayer and Brewing Funk Toberfest, uh, their own version of Oktoberfest at their location at 3 p.m. off of uh, Russell. Reverend Slanky will be there. Delicious food. Indulge in the Feast of Bratwurst, Pork Place, Sauerkraut, Bolivian Potato Salad, and of course pretzels that will transport your taste buds to Germany. Starting at 3 p.m. on Saturday, the Western State Special with Guest Imagination Brewing Company is going to be playing some rock music by Latent. Uh, Timber Rattlers live at Free Cycles is going to be some bluegrass music starting at 7 p.m. at Free Cycles. Uh, Fall Burlesque Show, Stave and Hoop is doing their own burlesque show starting at 7 p.m. It's $20 cover at the door and it has adult content. You must be 21 and over to enter. Sink and Season live at Monks. Uh, Monks is doing a uh, rock band starting at 8 p.m. Karaoke at Westside Lanes. I also should mention that Westside Lanes is also doing their uh, 40th anniversary uh, on Sunday as well. Uh, let, let me just double check. Oh, where is it? I thought I had it in here somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, where is it? Did I miss it? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Oh yeah, it's the 40th anniversary party at Westside Lanes and Funder Center starting at 8 a.m. on Saturday, celebrating 40 years in business. It's dollar, uh, $1.25 bowling, 83 cent rental shoes, 83 uh, sent hot dogs, best dressed in the 80s, trivia in the lounge, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. karaoke at the lounge at 9 p.m. and door prizes and more. So it's the 40th anniversary. It's a big deal that's going on there as well. If you're interested in uh, doing some karaoke, like I said, 9 p.m. at Westside Lanes, Idle Ranch Hands at Union Club at 9 p.m. Uh, Badlander doing some more uh, DJ Chris Moon DJ music at uh, 10 p.m. every Saturday. So. Um, those are pretty much your events for your Saturday, and there's some things happening on Sunday. If you're interested in doing a 5K, Community Medical Center is doing a Fierce Fab 5K starting at 8.30 a.m. Dance Wonder at Westside Theater, open for people who want to do some open dance. Skill Building Workshop, working with coils. Clay Studio does classes like this and more starting at 10 a.m. Soul Cycle, annual houseplant fundraiser. Free Cycles is hosting Soil Cycles annual houseplant uh, at 11 a.m. on Sunday. Dragons Love Tacos, MCT Center for Performing Arts. Uh, uh, it's rainy, gloomy day, and boy is sick of doing math homework, so he and his faithful dog, Leroy, sit down to watch a little TV. As they click through the channels, they come upon a show about dragons, which teaches them a remarkable secret. S dragons love tattoos. This is going to be MCT uh, Center for Performing Arts at 1 p.m. on Sunday. Hula Workshop. This is a, kind of like an annual thing they do during the school year. Uh, University of Montana, the third floor. Uh, they're doing a Hulu Workshop with Kamaka Kakuna. Um, and that's going to be at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Growing, Grow Music presents a series of focal, uh, of uh, featuring of local yokel youth, uh, Missoula Public Library at uh, 3 p.m. Students' performance at the works of Castle, 21 Pilots, Huckalo, Rebecca Clark, and more. This concert is free and open to all. It's at 3 p.m. at the Missoula Public Library. Comedy Hour at the Old Post at 8.30 p.m. Sunday night, and then finally Rocking Karaoke at the Sunrise Saloon at 8.30 p.m. on Sunday. So those, there's a lot, of ha a lot of things happening this weekend, including even on Sunday. Usually they kind of uh, stop after 5 p.m. There may be a couple yoga classes, but Sunday is usually pretty, uh, <coughs> pretty light overall. But um, I want to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.